This is amazing grace. today as the band begins the next song would you just turn to your neighbor just say hello this morning greet each other we're glad to have you here
singing this morning as we continue just remembering that Jesus paid it all. He died on the cross for us, rose from the dead. He paid it all. Crossroads. Happy Easter to you. We're glad that you're here this morning and uh, would like to ask you just for a few announcements this morning. Uh, if, first of all, if you'd pass the friendship folders down the aisle, that would greatly help us uh, this morning. Uh, the little black folder, just kind of grab that and, and pass it down and sign in there. Um, also, uh, just a few other thoughts this morning. Our Wednesday evenings uh, will be picking up again this Wednesday. We're excited about that. Uh, we have adult groups. There's uh, groups for men, groups for women. There are also um, 
Groups for Children, our, our Wednesday night program, the Clubhouse Kids will be back in action. That's all at 6.30 this week. And then over at the, uh, at the Connect Student Building, we have our teens will be meeting, middle and high school students. So everything kicks back in on Wednesday evening. What a great week it was here. Thursday and Friday, we had our Eyes of Faith and uh, just incredible time as, as we gathered and our choir presented, which I want to thank our choir. If, uh, let's thank our choir. I mean, we got about two-thirds of them up here today. All right. Uh, I just am so thankful for, thankful for their hard work to make this uh, a reality and, uh, and to give us, uh, help us to worship our Lord. So it was a fantastic Thursday and Friday. And and then, of course, we had Saturday service and the first service, and, and then we have today. So we're thanking God for all that he's doing. Um, next week, we're going to begin a series called Christ, uh, The Hope of Glory, Christ in Us, The Hope of Glory. You know, when you think about Easter, a, there's a lot of glory and there's a lot of hope with Easter. And then we want to take it and we want to go to the next step, the hope of glory. How do you have the hope of glory in your life every day? And that's what we're going to begin to talk about next week. So I hope you'll join us next week as we continue. We're going to start a series that will go for four weeks on the hope of glory. We're excited about what God is doing uh, in our lives and in our church. God is moving in our church. It's a really exciting time for our church right now. Uh, many, many things are happening. People are, are becoming followers of Christ, and that's an exciting time for us. Um, this morning, we're going to receive our morning offering in just a moment. And, uh, but if you, are, if you were planning to give an Easter offering, you know, in years gone by, we've talked about an Easter offering, and we really didn't talk about that much. But uh, if you'd like to give a, an offering over and above your tithe and, and regular offering, uh, feel free to do so. There are Easter envelopes in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the seat in front of you there in the little pouch. And uh, feel free to do that, and we will use it for God's glory for, to further His work here and around the world. So we're, we're excited about all that God has done. Uh, you know, what, what an amazing thing. Isn't it amazing that uh, it, we, it's, I feel like we just got over Christmas because Easter was so early, you know? Uh, but God raised $80,000 here to give to missionaries around the world. So let's give God a hand for that. That's really exciting stuff. And so today we encourage you, if you'd like to give, please do so. Um, I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward at this time as we receive the morning offering. Um, if, you, if you're a guest here, uh, if this is your first time, I'd like to encourage you to stop by our Welcome Center. We have a nice little gift, uh, little gift bag out there for you, um, a little bit of chocolate in there. How can you have Easter without chocolate, right? But there's a little bit of chocolate in there and some other nice things that will be encouraging to you. And uh, we are so glad that you're here. And if you're our guest, please let the offering plate pass you by today. Um, this, this is for those that are coming and on a regular basis, and, and they're growing in the grace of giving. So we don't want anybody to ever feel obligated to give. Um, and so some, as a matter of fact, some of our people give online, some give in the mail, and some will give here today. So if you're our guest, please feel free. Let that pass you by, all right? Let's pray as we receive our morning offering. Father God, we come before you, and we are just so excited about what you're doing. You're an awesome God. Thank you for the way you love us. Thank you for your sacrifice, uh, for the way that we come together today to celebrate the risen Lord. God, we are so honored to be called your children. We're so honored to gather here and to, to sing these songs, to lift you up, and, and, to, and to reflect on who you are this morning. God, as we, as we receive the morning offering, I just ask that you'll be with each gift and each giver and that you will touch each one, Lord. Um, allow them to give as, according as you've told them to give, Lord. And uh, we'll be honored and blessed by all that you're going to do uh, as, we, as we reach a community here for Jesus, and not only here in Finleyville and Pittsburgh, but around the world. God, we love you, and we are so thankful for all that you're doing. Be with us now as we give to you in obedience to what you've asked us to do. In your name we pray. Amen. I can see the waters raging at my feet. I can feel the breath of those surrounding me. I can hear the sound of nations rising. I can walk down this dark and painful road. I can face every fear of the unknown. I can hear all God's children singing out. 
we will not be overtaken we will not be overcome the same power that rose Jesus from the grave the same power that commands the dead to wake lives in us lives in In our sermon, our message this morning, the resurrection changes everything. I want you to think about that because the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that's what we're here to celebrate today, and it's been a great celebration so far. Amen? Let's give our singers and musicians a hand. We really thank them this morning. <clears throat> the, the resurrection of Jesus changes everything. If there were no resurrection, there would be no need for us to be here this morning. Um, if there were no resurrection, your life would be totally changed. If there were no resurrection, you'd be looking at time differently. Um, you know, the, the resurrection of Jesus, the life and the resurrection, the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus causes us to split history between B.C. and A.D. Um, it is, it is earth-shattering. It is life-changing. And so we need to understand this morning the importance of the resurrection. If there were no resurrection. Okay, if there were no resurrection, life would be really hard. And you know what? I found this out, that uh, a lot of people think the church is about issues. You know, people say, well, the church stands on this, the church this, the church that. Um, let me tell you this. None of those issues matter compared to the resurrection. 
As a matter of fact, if I look in the Bible, I look in the Bible, and you know what? I don't see, after Jesus rose from the dead, I don't see a whole lot of, uh, of them going on about, about issues. The, what, the issue was that Jesus rose from the dead. And that's the issue this morning, and that is why we exist. Our church, we exist here to bring people into a growing relationship with Jesus. Why? Because he rose from the dead. And, and, and this morning we're going to look. First of all, the Apostle Paul tells us a couple things here. He says about if, if there were no resurrection, okay, if the tomb was not empty. And I'm just going to read to you a few verses this morning. If the tomb were not empty, um, he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 14, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. Now, what he's saying, I'm, I'm just going to translate that over. He says, if Christ has not been raised, then you're preaching, your faith is in vain. He's saying this, if, if the tomb was not empty, then Christianity is a pipe dream. And that's the common language that I'll use, right? That's the Ken Barner translation. Um, listen, he, he says, look, your life, your faith would be in vain. There would be no need for you to be going to church, no need for you to be reading the Bible, because if Jesus did not rise from the dead, it, uh, see, when Jesus rose from the dead, it validated everything. If we didn't have that validation, if we didn't have this resurrection, if we only had Good Friday, Easter has two parts. There's Good Friday, the crucifixion, the sacrifice, and then the resurrection. Without the resurrection, Good Friday isn't very good at all. Without the resurrection, Friday, Friday doesn't, doesn't matter. It doesn't change anything. It was the resurrection when Jesus had the power to overcome death. And that, res that validated the sacrifice uh, that, that was made for us there. So we have to have, and if you just, you know, if Jesus just lived, came and lived, was a good teacher, and, uh, and lived to be 60, 70 years old and died of cancer, um, that wouldn't have mattered. Because the Bible says without the giving of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Over in the book of Hebrews, Paul tells us that. So the, the resurrection is a crucial, it is crucial. Nothing else compares, nothing else pales compared to the resurrection. Um, he says here in ver verse 14, if Christ has not been raised, uh, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misre misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if the dead are not raised. In other words, he's saying, look, because, because Christ rose, also we will rise. One day we will rise. And that's a, that's a, that's a whole other story that we have and not enough time to talk about, but one day God will rise us. And our, we will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, the Bible talks about. So that's a, a fun event coming down the road. But he says, look, our words, we would be misrepresenting. So even the Bible would not have validity if Jesus did not rise from the dead. And that's what, that's what gives the Bible all validity. That's why I, everything in this book, that's why I, I believe it. Because Jesus quoted from it. And Jesus, not only did he quote from it, but he rose from the dead. That makes it so much more powerful because he validated the entire message of the Bible. Uh, verse 16, for if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. Verse 17, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sin. If, the second thing this morning, if the tomb was not empty. Scripture's telling us here that heaven would be a myth. Heaven would not exist. He says, look, if you have not been raised, your faith is futile. You're still in your sin. Verse 18, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have also perished. So the resurrection is crucial to all of these issues. Verse 19, if in Christ we have hope in, the li in this life only, we are of all, mo of all people most to be pitied. Of all people. He says, if the crucifixion did not happen, out of all people, all the religions in the world, you're the pitied. We would be the ones who would be foolish. Christians would be foolish. If Christ had not risen from the dead, we would be foolish to continue just following some regiment, some uh, just, just trying to have a transformation of life on our own. He says, listen, it is the power of the cross, the power of the resurrection, what he did and how he rose again. Verse 20, but in fact, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead the first fruits of those who've fallen asleep. He says, Christ has been, in fact, raised from the dead. Uh, 30, in 33 AD, Jesus was crucified on a cross. He was resurrected, and at that time, there were just a handful of followers. 
compared to what we see now. Uh, we saw that he would speak and there would be 5,000 show up. Um, and, th and that 5,000 would have, that was the count of men. And then there would be women and children on top of that. So there'd be 15,000. But the actual tight disciples and followers, we know the 12, we know there were 70, we know of 120. And, and so at the early stage, it was just a few hundred people. And, and that, we see that in the book of Acts. But after Jesus resurrects from the dead, we see an incredible thing that happens. We see that Christianity, now let me explain this to you today. Today, there are 2.3 billion people that claim to be Christian. 2.3 billion people around the world that claim to be Christian. Do you realize today there are 2 billion people that have come to celebrate the resurrected Lord? Now that's pretty exciting. That is, that's the equivalent of one in every three people on the planet. Uh, the Christian church is the largest organization, organization on the planet. You are part of an organization that is bigger than anything. It is bigger than any other organization. You, you may be a member of so many other things, but listen, the church of Jesus Christ is in every corner of the earth. And you, you, it's pretty cool that we get to be a part of it. 2.3 billion people. Do you realize that is bigger than China, Europe, and America put together? Wow. That's a lot of followers of Christ. Um, how, did a, how did a group of 12 guys start, start a movement that went on? It was the, the resurrection that spurred this movement. It's called the church that we know today. What's amazing is, is this, that Jesus never wrote a book. He never wrote a book. We have the Bible. Uh, people have recorded for us, but Jesus didn't write a book. While he was there on earth, we don't have the book of Jesus. Uh, we have his life recorded for us, but yet there are more books written about him than any other person. Uh, we have... Uh, he never composed a song. But listen to all the songs that have been composed about him. More songs are written about him. Uh, he never left us any artwork. But look at all the artwork that we have that is centered around Christ and around Christianity. Um, he never built a building. And think about that. Look at all the, the great architecture of our world. Jesus never built a building. But yet, there are more great architectures that were built in the name of God, built in churches. Go through Europe and look at these great cathedrals. The other day, my daughter asked me, Dad, why is there a steeple in the church? And I was like, uh-oh. I'm not quite sure. And I responded, I said, uh, I think because it points up to God. And she goes, okay. I said, oh, thank God, 17, she still believes me, right? Uh, listen, listen, the, the, the architecture the, all over the world was built to point up to God. Uh, he never even built a building. And then uh, Jesus, his whole life was confined to one area, Israel. He, he never traveled the whole world. I've probably traveled more around the world than he did. I've been to, uh, you know, Haiti, Grenada, place we're going to go this summer, Ecuador. I've been all over the place. Jesus didn't have that much travel. But yet, he has followers in every corner of the world. How did it happen? What happened? It was the resurrection. Listen, the resurrection changes everything. The fact that his message, his message, when, when his message was strong, it was clear, powerful teaching, but when he resurrected from the dead, it validated everything. All the records that we have, all the truth that we have, it is validated. All his teaching has now so much the more powerful because Jesus rose from the dead. And because he rose from the dead, you don't have to live with guilt and shame of your sin anymore. That's the most exciting part. You see, most people carry a load of shame, guilt, regret. Um, and, and you can go on, you can go on and on about this list. God says, listen, I came to die for your sin. Jesus came to pay for that sin. Ephesians 1, 7 says that in Christ, we have redemption through his, through his blood. In other words, we've been set free by the blood of his death. And so we have forgiveness of sins because of his grace. The grace that we don't deserve. God's riches at Christ's expense. We, we get this awesome gift that God gives to us. And, he, and, and it's all because of what he did on that cross. Consider what Jesus did on the cross. Um, not only his crucifixion, but the whole week. And last Sunday we talked about, you know, Palm Sunday. And Jesus comes in on a triumphal entry. And how exciting that must have been for three million people around the city of during Passover. And uh, it was a high day. But yet things turn 
The crowd turns on him because they had an expectation that he would be a strong leader, that he would set up a kingdom right there. And God's kingdom that he was setting up was so much bigger than the nation of Israel. His kingdom that he was setting up was to go into your heart and invade your life, invade your home, and, 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 and give you peace, to give you a, a home in heaven that would last forever. His kingdom was far greater than a political event. And so, what happened that week? He goes through six trials. Three were religious and three were Roman. Um, uh, he, he stands before, for, before Annas, the, uh, the key religious leader. And then he comes before Caiaphas, the high priest. Then he goes before the Sanhedrin. That was the, like the religious supreme court of the day. Then he stands before Pilate. He was the governor of Judea. Then he stands before Herod, the governor of Galilee. And then he's tossed back to Pilate again. And after six trials, what did they come up with? They came up with nothing. Uh, they, they, they had no, Jesus had lived a perfect life. Understand this, Jesus came to this earth and he was born of a virgin birth and he lived a perfect sinless life. He never once did anything wrong. And so he did this, he's growing up living this life and then he starts his public ministry and throughout his public ministry, he would tell them that I and the Father are one. He identified himself. He started to reveal who he was. And as he did that, the religious leaders just could not take it. And the accusation that they come up for him is that he claims to be the Son of God. True. He claimed to be the Son of God. True. And so they continue on, and they take him to the cross. And on his way to the cross... Jesus was, uh, he was blindfolded and beaten. And imagine these people as they blindfold him and beat him and they're, and they're tossing him around and saying, oh, who, uh, who hit you now? You're the son of God. Tell us what's going on. Who hit you now? And they're mocking him. They, they take a crown of thorns and they take the crown of thorns and they, they put it on his head and, they, and, they, and they, they put it in deeply on his head and they pull his beard and they pluck his beard. Then they flogged him, the Bible says. They scourged him. They, they, they took the whip with, with bone pieces in it and just and whipping it. And, and, and it's, it's this blood and flesh being torn all over the place. And the Bible says that Jesus was beaten beyond recognition. And he did that for you. He did that to pay for your sin. See, Jesus didn't come and do that for no reason. He didn't, this was no chance. This was a divine appointment that he had. There was a mission from heaven to the cross. And that was a rescue mission, to rescue your soul, to rescue my soul. And so when Jesus did that, he came, and he, and he took on this brutal beating all the way to death. He goes in, uh, and they, he, he begins to carry a heavy cross up the hill, and then it, it's too heavy for him. He's so worn out, he's so beaten. And then Simon, a man, uh, carries it for him. What a privilege it must have been for him to carry that cross. And then the crucifixion. Uh, he, he's put on the cross. His hands are, are put into the cross. They, they nail his hands. They nail his feet onto the cross. And here Jesus dies. Typically, it was death by suffocation, just, just by the very nature of it. And, and they would let these people hang up there, and they came to Jesus. Normally, they would break the legs just to make sure that they, were, that they would die. And here they come to Jesus, and Jesus was already dead. He paid the price for your sin. They stick a spear into his side just to be sure. And even in his worst hour of pain, you were on his mind. While he was on the cross, you were on his mind. He was focused on a mission to pay for your sin. He even cried out on the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. For the very people that were crucifying him, he was coming to save them. Why did that happen? Who put Jesus on the cross? We look at the people. You look at the, you look at the religious leaders, and we have all these different thoughts. Isaiah 53, 6 says this. I'm going to just read this. We'll put that up on the screen here. Isaiah 53, 6 says, All of us like sheep have, we've gone astray. We've strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. On, on Christ on the cross, the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He laid your sin on him. Next. He was also oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. Verse 8. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream, but he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. Verse 9. 
he had done no wrong and had never been deceived and never and had never deceived anyone but he was buried like a criminal he was put in a rich man's grave this words of Isaiah was written 700 years before Christ came Christ fulfilled 300 prophecies it's incredible you can't you couldn't just randomly do this there was a mission that God had, and all the, all the foretelling led to that day on the cross. And look, he was even put in a rich man's grave. I, I've often thought about verse 6, about how my, my sins were laid on him. And I've often thought about verse 10, but boy, didn't that just stand out to me about the rich man's grave. That's what, where he was placed in Joseph of Arimathea's grave. Verse 10 says, but it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Who put Jesus on the cross was... God the Father. It says that the prophet tells us it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet whenever, uh, yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will, he will enjoy a long life and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. Wow. We put him there. God the Father placed him there to take our sin. And so when Jesus died on that cross, he did that. There was not happenstance. It was not just, just an event that occurred. It was an appointment that Jesus had to pay for your sin, to pay for my sin. Romans 4.25 says that Jesus was handed over to die because of our sins and that he was raised from the dead to make us righteous, to make us right with God. That's why he rose again, to make you right with God. Um, you can't make yourself right with God. You can try all you want. You'll never make yourself right with God. Only God can make you right. And it's, see, if there was no crucifixion, if there were no resurrection, this could not have happened. And so Paul tells us in Romans, he says that he was raised from the dead. Why was he raised from the dead? To make you right with God. Wow, what an awesome God. What an awesome God. Listen, Jesus went to the cross. God doesn't love me because Jesus was my substitute. Jesus was my substitute because God loves me. God loved you so much that he said, I cannot take that. I, I, I want you to be my child. I want to have this relationship. So he sends his own son. What a powerful, powerful thing. But if it ended there, we would be the most miserable people. Over in John chapter 20, we're going to look this morning. John chapter 20, we find out that, that we have great reason for celebration, great reason for joy because of who Jesus is, because of what he did. John chapter 20, beginning in verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark. Mary Magdalene was one of Jesus' most famous followers, uh, female followers, one of his most famous female followers. He had cast a demon out from Mary Magdalene. Uh, Mary Magdalene felt hopelessness, despair, um, all these type of things, and Jesus transformed her life. Jesus radically changed her. But you know what? She believed that Jesus was a great teacher. She believed that Jesus was from God. She believed that he was a man of compassion like anybody that she had never seen. Uh, none of the religious leaders were compassionate like Jesus was. And certainly none of the Roman, Roman authorities were compassionate like Jesus was. And so she was a follower of Christ. And she believed that he was like no other person that she had ever met. But on this morning, Easter Sunday morning, Jesus has been buried and she's walking to the tomb to treat his body. She's, this is what the women were doing. They were coming down to, to treat his body with spices, uh, with myrrh and, and spices like that. Kind of an embalming process, if you were. And because they were expecting Jesus to be dead. You see, even at this point, in, at this point and we have this actual record of the history. At this point on Easter Sunday morning, it's the crack of dawn. Uh, Jesus died on Good Friday, and they had to take his body off the cross. And for the Jews, if you, if you understand a little bit about the Sabbath, the, the Jews have a Sabbath, and on Friday at sundown, they, 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 they would begin, and they were not allowed to do anything. There was no work could happen on that, on that moment. So as Jesus died, they quickly got him off the cross. They go before Pilate, and, and Joseph of Arimathea comes and gets the body of Jesus off the cross. Um, what would happen in those days, it was typical to let the body hang on a cross. A Romans crucified many, many people. Hundreds and hundreds of people were crucified. Jesus was not the only one to be crucified. It was a common way of a criminal to die. 
And so when Jesus is crucified, what, was, what would normally happen? They would just let the body hang up there, and birds would eat off of this body, and, and it was just a really gross. It's just one of the most gruesome things. But they came to Jesus. And, and, and listen, here's another thing that, according to the Romans, the Romans typically would not bury. They would take their criminal and just throw them out to the dump. They would just dispose of this body. It would be just some, some foolish thing. And, oh, that criminal, that dumb criminal. And they would just throw the body away. And if you wanted to get the body, you had to go and pay Pilate. You had to talk to somebody, know somebody. And so the Jews, the Jews, this was highly, they could not let a Jewish person not be buried. And so they come before, they come before Pilate and, and Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. They go and they make a deal with Pilate that they can take the body and put it in Joseph's tomb, which was nearby Golgotha, which wasn't very far. And what was happening was on Easter morning, they had come and they were ready to treat the body. Why were the women coming to treat the body? I've heard it said that, well, you know, these men, two men took it down off took it down off the cross on Friday. And, you know, the woman, they said, it just wasn't good enough, right? They said, this had to be done right. And so the women came and they said, we're going we're gonna to do this. With, this was hurried. This was a hurried event. We're going to actually take the time and care for this. And so they did. And that's what they were coming for. They, they were coming down. Uh, and and so, so, so she comes down to the tomb here. Um, and the, second, the next part of verse 1 says, and she saw that the stone had been rolled away from the tomb. She sees that the stone has been rolled away from the tomb. And it's very interesting what happens. So next, she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. That's, the one, that's John here. This is from the book of John. John's an eyewitness to these events. So he's, he's, he's showing you his identity. He's, you know, the one that Jesus loved. That's me. So, so she ran and went to Simon Peter, the other disciple, and the one whom Jesus loved. And, uh, and said to them, now check this out. They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have laid him. She was not yet believing that he rose from the dead. Uh, she had not seen him yet. She, she was thinking that his body was taken away. Verse 3, so Peter went out from the, with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Um, you know what, what's going on in their minds? That Jesus' body was stolen. I'm going to show you a clip this morning. I want you to watch this clip. It helps us to think a little bit about what was going on in their mind, in their hearts. Um, they had, it had, the light hadn't gone off yet. They were in a moment of grief, hopelessness, and despair, as anybody would be after the loss of a loved one. It's still dark when she comes to the tomb. Through her tear-filled eyes, she sees that the stone has been moved away from the tomb. She assumes the worst. His body has been stolen. Who knows what they've done with it? Even her grief has been violated. How could they do this? Keep watching. 
watch at the door. Open it for no one but me. Crucify him? Or do they have to abuse even his corpse? But what would they want with his body? To tie it behind a horse and drag it through the streets? Maybe feed it to the dogs outside the city gate, who knows? We have to tell the others. to give you a little bit of thought of how the grief that they were experiencing. We know this, it says that whenever they reached the tomb, verse eight, then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. And it says, for yet they did not understand the scriptures that he must be raised from the dead. I read some scholars that say at this point, it says that they believe that the body was stolen. That the other, the others say that he believed that Jesus had risen from the dead. Uh, but one thing we know for sure is that there wasn't a natural reaction to find a dead person come back to life. Dead people don't normally come back to life. Um, you know, I've buried several people from my family. And uh, when we go through those, those, the wake and the, the viewing and all that, you know, I'm, at the viewing, I'd sit there and I'd go over and you'd see a body. And, you know, you'd look at it and you'd say, my eyes are, that body just start to move a little bit. And did you ever do that? Maybe, like, is it me or is he breathing? All right, now, come on. Somebody else be honest up here, okay? All right, you know, and, and you're, you're sitting there, and it's like your eyes are playing tricks on you because you, you really want it so bad, right? Listen, there's no tricks on their eyes. The body was gone. They, was, they were expecting a dead body, and they get there, and they're, they're down, they're depressed until they meet the risen Lord. Verse 10, then the disciples went back to their homes. Uh, you know what? We see, we see, why is that in there? Why do we see this moment of grief and despair? Because it provides validity to the Scripture. Um, you know, if I was going to make up a story for you and give you a story about, about how great I was, I wouldn't be telling you how bad I was, would I? I wouldn't tell you, I wouldn't tell you, well, you know, and there was that moment he was really afraid to get up and preach on Easter Sunday. I wouldn't tell you that, would I? I would say, oh, and how wonderful. Uh, you know, if you were writing the story, maybe you would write it and say, yes, and I saw the empty tomb, and immediately I believed, wouldn't you? And you would just go, you would go, go into those type of things. But we see here from John, we see here, look, there's th these moments of disbelief. Why? Because it, they were real, and they had a real encounter with the risen Lord. Now, verse, verse 11, we get to the fun part. Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to, the, to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing. But she did not know, what, she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? supposing him to be the gardener. So she still isn't looking for the risen Lord. She's looking for a dead body. And she turns around and she says, she, said to, she says to him, Sir, if you, have, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. She thinks it's the gardener. And then Jesus responds, Mary. And all of a sudden it kicked in. She turned and said to him, Rabbi, 
teacher. She recognized him. And she said, Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. Listen, the reason that we believe this morning, we have so much evidence. The evidence is overwhelming. If you look through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you will find out that these were eye, there were eyewitness accounts that are compiled for us. I mean, you know what? the empty tomb is not enough to prove it. It's the eyewitnesses that seal the deal. So you can go and you can take a body out of a grave, right? Anybody can do that. But Jesus went the full way. Not only did he rise, but he was appeared to more than 500 people over a period of 40 days. And so if you go to the book of Matthew, uh, Matthew saw a risen Savior and he documented it. Matthew, the tax collector, he, 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 he was transformed by God. Uh, you, you see the documentation of the life of Christ and, and he documents for us who, uh, that Jesus was, was alive. So we have a real person that witnessed it and gives us documentation. Mark spent time with Peter who sat at a, a sat who saw a risen Savior, and he wrote it all down. He marked it down. So Mark spends time with Peter. He gets it out of Peter, and he pulls it down. And, he, and so you got the book of Mark. You can go through and see the compilation of the documentation of the risen Lord. Uh, you go to the book of Luke. Luke, was, uh, Luke investigated every single eyewitness that he could, and he documented it. Go to the beginning of Luke, and you'll see. He tells you right in chapter 1 that Luke was an investigative. and It's like an investigative reporter. He's pulling it all together. By the way, every person that has ever set out uh, to, to, prove, to disprove the resurrection, it's amazing how God transformed them. Uh, you hear great stories of a guy like Josh McDowell, Lee Strobel. I'd encourage you, go get a book called The Case for Christ. Uh, you can go on your Kindle and download it before dinner. I mean, it's a fantastic book. It will give you some of these, the evidences. Listen, the evidence for the resurrection is overwhelming. Um, John saw a living, crucified Jesus. He walks away from the cross. John walks away from the cross with his arm around the mother of Jesus. And John records for us that this Lord was risen from the dead. Peter, Peter says that he saw him die. And he spent time with the risen Savior. Jesus, the brother of James. I heard one pastor say, what would it take for your brother to convince you that he was the Son of God? Now think about that, okay? Um, Jesus, James, the brother of Jesus. Uh, J James shows up in, in the book of Acts over in Jerusalem, and he says that his brother is his Messiah and his Lord. Uh, Paul was the chief persecutor. Paul had persecuted this new movement. Paul persecuted Christianity. He was the chief persecutor, and he becomes on fire for God. Why? Because he met the risen Lord. And he, he's written more about the resurrection probably than, than most authors in the Bible. And we just see over and over from Paul about the resurrected Lord, how important it is, how powerful it is. And so if this is true, and it is, we have all this evidence. We have all this documentation. These people weren't expecting it. Jesus tried to tell them. They didn't catch it till they see him. And now we have a movement that went from a few hundred people to 2.3 billion people today because of eyewitness testimony. Because the resurrection is real. It is undeniable. You cannot refute the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. And if it is real, if the tomb is empty and Jesus is alive today, number one, Jesus must be taken seriously. He must be taken seriously. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one comes to the Father except through me. That means if Jesus resurrected from the, from the grave, what he said is true. It validates every word he ever said. It validates every, every piece of scripture for us. So now... That means for you. You're trying to earn your way to heaven. You say, well, I'll be good. I can do this. I, I, you know, I'll just keep turning over a new leaf. Jesus said, I am the only way. And in a day and age where we're, we're, we're afraid of things that are restrictive and all-conclusive, Jesus says, I am the only way. You cannot get to God by any other means. 
You will not get to the Father. You will not get to heaven. You will not get to, to, to be with God by being a good person. You will not get to God by, by some religious act, by some ritual, by anything that you can come up with. It is only through Jesus. So today, I challenge you, if the resurrection is real, then he cannot be taken lightly. He must be taken seriously. And it's time for you to make it personal. Time to take it from a head faith to a heart faith and say, okay, God, I know that you died, but now I'm going to make this for me and I'm going to accept your sacrifice for me. Um, how, about over, uh, how about this? My priorities change big time. I, I, my life will, will take on a radically different look because I am a follower of Christ. And as I follow Christ, my priorities are totally different. Um, he says here in Luke 18, chapter, uh, Luke chapter 18, verse 29, Truly I say to you, this is Jesus speaking, there is no one who has left house, brothers, parents, or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many more times in this time and in the age to come eternal life. He says, if you'll follow me, you'll be blessed beyond measure. He, if you follow me, you'll, you, you'll, never be, you'll, never be, you'll never regret it. Even the people who have followed Christ and given their life and sacrificed and sacrificed money and all kind of things, I don't see them having regrets because they followed Christ. And lastly this morning, there is nothing. If Jesus rose from the dead, there is nothing too big that cannot be fixed. There's nothing too broken that cannot be fixed. You come and you say, my life is shattered. I've got a mess on my hands. Guess what? God says, come to me. All who are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Uh, maybe today you, you're here and you, you have issues. You have issues with re religion and Christianity. Guess what? There's no other issue that matters but the resurrection. No other issue. You, you, you know, when you stand before God, you can tell God all you want about the hypocrites who want the church. Because they'll still keep going to church. But you have to stand before God. It, you know, I, I always tell people about hypocrites, you know. I have a membership at a health club. <laughs> Why are you laughing? And I carry that membership in my wallet, don't I? And when I go in, I'm never offended by all those people who are buffed and working out. And they're never well, they may be offended by me, you know. But, you know, whenever, do you understand? That, that's, that's what we do. We say, well, I'm not going to go to church. I'm not going to follow God because of somebody else. And this, the issue is you. I can't say anything about my health because of anything else. I have to deal with that. And you have to deal with your life before God. And I have to deal with my life before God. Because when I stand in the presence of an almighty Savior, there's nobody else to answer. My wife can't answer. My parents won't be there. My kids won't even vouch for me. They barely vouch for me now, right? <laughs> Nobody can vouch for me. I have to stand before God. And so here's, my, here's what I want to encourage you to. If Jesus said, come to me, all you that are weak and heavy laden, I will give you rest. I am gentle and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls. If, if that's what he said, and he rose from the dead, it's truth. And it will change your life. So what I want to invite you to do this morning is, is to go from just believing a bunch of facts about the resurrection. You know the story. Most people in our land do know the story. They've heard about the crucifixion, the trial, the betrayal, the death, and the resurrection. But you know what? The Bible says that even the enemy, even Satan and his demons believe that as a fact. God wants you to trust them in your heart. And today I want to invite you to make it personal because God wants to heal your family. He wants to heal your marriage. He wants to heal your, your relationships. He wants to heal everything about you, all the things that you're struggling with out there. And look, there, there's, there's things that I don't have a clue. You've all, everybody's come in here. I don't know what your situation is, but God does. And God says, if you'll come to me, the risen Lord, if you'll stand before me and recognize that I, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, there's no other help for your life. Oh, yeah, you can say, well, I'll go out and I'll do this. And the people have done that for years. They go out, they party, they do this. They, they just fill their life with all these different things. And, and you know what? It doesn't change the truth. It doesn't change the truth. So this morning, I invite you to receive the risen Lord. He says to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's not a head faith. He's talking about a heart faith to trust. If you will trust him, 
he will give you eternal life. If you will trust him, he'll give you life, an abundant life. Let's bow in prayer. With our heads bowed and eyes closed this morning, we're going to prepare and we're going to close our service with a baptism in here in just a few moments. One of our young people has come and said, I've taken this from a head faith to a heart faith. And that's how we're going to close today, talking about a heart faith. But I want to invite you. Maybe you need to come to trust Christ. And, um, and I'd like to ask you today, on this Easter 2016, would you open your heart to Christ? Would you make this personal? Would you take it from, from I know all those facts to I'm trusting that he died on the cross to pay for my sin, that he indeed rose from the grave. If he rose from the grave, it changes everything. Will you let him? Will you let him in? And if that's you today, I want to encourage you, just pray a prayer like this, something like this. Dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. I've done wrong things. And I believe that you died on the cross. You paid for my sin. While you were on the cross, I was on your mind. You didn't stay dead. You were buried, and three days later, you rose again. And God, I invite you into my life right now. God, I thank you for that gift of eternal life. I thank you. I thank you that, that you, will, you will help me. That you will help me conquer the areas of my life. And for others in here, maybe you've, you've been a follower of Christ, but, but it's been a while. It's been a while since the, the resurrection, the power of the resurrection made a difference in your life. It's been a while since you've taken it serious and and, and maybe you've just gotten comfortable. You're just, you're just kind of making decisions based on you and not based on God. He is alive. And the fact that He's alive changes everything. Will you make this right with God this morning? Will you just retool your heart and say, God, I need you. Give me that fresh focus. Lord, I'm going to walk out of this building today focused on your power in my life. I need you to transform my life, Lord. Father God, be with each person as we respond to the miracle of the resurrection, to your goodness, to your grace. And Lord, how you validated everything about you when you rose from the dead, God. I thank you that it is true. I thank you that the facts are undeniable, that the evidence is incredible. Jesus is alive. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing just a verse of a song, and then we're going to have a baptism. Your word, it stands eternal 
Your kingdom knows no end. Your praise goes on forever. And on and on again. No power can stand against you. No curse assault your throne. No one can steal your glory. For it is yours alone. I stand to sing your praises. I stand to testify. For I was dead in my sin. But now I rise. I will rise. As Christ was raised to life. Now in Him. Now in Him. I live. I will rise. I will rise. As Christ was raised to life. Now in Him. Now in her story before she gets baptized. Hi, my name is Jordan Curry, and I'm from Monongahela. I grew up in a church that my family attended in the area, and through that church, I was able to go on a mission trip to Ethiopia. While I was there one Sunday, I was able to go to church by myself, and that's when I learned that I needed to make my relationship with Christ my own. Two years later, I went to Winter Jam, a big Christian concert with Straight Street. I saw people throwing up their hands and worshiping God. I knew I wanted to be a part of this great family. I listened to one of the pastors at Winter Jam tell us about the gospel and how Jesus died on the cross for me. I opened up my arms and accepted Jesus Christ into my heart and began this new journey. After graduation, I was praying for something at Robert Morris University that would continue my relationship and keep my faith growing in God during college. I found a campus ministry group called Chi Alpha, and ever since then, I've been a part of their youth ministry on Wednesday nights and Sunday mornings and have built a strong relationship with the people there. Right before my sophomore year, my best friend Caitlin passed away suddenly. I knew this was a really hard time for my friends and me but I knew that God was using me through this to help others understand that He has a plan. A verse she had tweeted and I read at her funeral was Jeremiah 29 11. You do not understand now what is going on, but one day you will. I asked God to give me the strength to speak this at her funeral. This past winter, I had an opportunity for an internship. As I began praying for God to lead me to the right one, I was offered the first internship I interviewed for, but I had a funny feeling about it and decided not to take it. So I continued praying and was offered two of my dream internship opportunities. One was available for the spring and the other will take place in the summer. I know God has a plan for me through these internships and He showed me that I can trust in Him. Ever since last summer, my devotions have grown. My relationship with God through prayer and His Word have become an important part of my life. I know that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. God is on the move and He will live in my heart forever. Thank you for all your love and support as my journey with Christ continues. And Jordan, it's exciting to hear how that you're your faith has become your own and just through talking to you personally knowing that you went from a head faith to knowing about God to a heart faith what we've talked about today where you understand that Christ died was buried for your sin and that he came back to life again for you and uh, and so upon your profession of faith and obedience to the Lord's command Jordan Curry I do now baptize you my sister in Christ in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit buried in the likeness of Christ's death raised in the likeness of his resurrection.
We're, we're so thankful. Uh, so many people have been pouring into her life and God's been working in her life for a long time and just to see her make some serious decisions. A, a student at Robert Morris College uh, University right now and uh, just down the street and right here from Monongahela. We're so thankful for what God has done in her life. Uh, baptism is an outward sign of an inward decision. It's, uh, it's her outward sign of what God has done inside. So I'd like to ask you to uh, just give her another hand of, a, of a applause because of her step of following Christ. All right, folks, let's stand together and uh, God bless you. Greet those around you. Happy Easter.